so this morning, I want to talk to you about forgiveness. Now, most of us in here probably uh, don't, if you're, depending on your age, you probably don't remember um, some of the ugly things that have taken place in the world, but there's been some things that have happened in our world that have really been tragic. And some of us have experienced some of those things. So I want to read, if I can, out of Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to start reading with verse number 21. I've titled this message, From the Scripture, How Many Times? How Many Times? Matthew chapter 18, verse number 21. We're going to read all the way through verse number 35, so don't be in a hurry. Then Peter came to Jesus, and he asked, Lord, how many times? Say it with me. How many times? Shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but seventy and seven times. And some translations it's used seventy times seven. The 490 is an actual an equation. Jesus was pushing the matter past their limits. He was he was answering them. You know, 700 million. He, they were, they were. Peter was asking a real good question that needed to be answered for everybody. So it said, therefore, the kingdom of heaven, this is Jesus now telling a parable. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle his accounts with his servants. And as he began to settle, a man owed him 10,000 bags of gold. He was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children, and all that he had be sold and, and to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Let me read that again. Canceled the debt. And let him go. Does that you, you feel that? I hope you do. Because that's what he did for us. Verse 28. But when that servant went out. Now it's interesting. I think. I have a brain that thinks really weird. Okay. So my mind goes. Okay. How long was he out? Was this a few hours? A day? A few days? Was it a week? Sometime after he left. In the moment where people had already known what was going on, okay, he went out and he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. I don't know about you, but I know in the world, when you get in debt, you often start thinking about the ones that owe you. He grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. Verse 29, his fellow servant fell to his knees and he begged him, be patient with me and I will, I'll pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and he, handed the man, he had the man thrown into prison until he could pay back the debt. Now, how are you going to pay back a debt when you're in prison? Okay. When the other servants around saw what had happened, now that, you got to highlight that portion of the scripture. Because I'm just going to say this to you. Everybody is watching. Everybody watches how you act. Everybody watches how you handle an injustice. Everybody watches how you handle a situation that in the world you would have just lost your mind. Let me get a little deeper. Can I get a little deeper this morning? Without, any, without offending anybody, okay? Your family knows you really well. They know how you've been handling things. Let me say it this way. They know how you used to, how you used to handle things. The first time you don't handle things the way you used to handle them, the way you handled them before Christ, they're shocked. I don't know. How do you do that? Man, bro, I've learned the difference between bro and bro. So my grandson, he's teaching me. I'm, I'm learning lingo. So, so people are watching all the time. Look at your neighbor. Say, all the time. 
They watch you at your job. They listen to the words that you speak. They listen to the things that you do. They listen and they watch how you respond to things. Are you hearing me, church? Praise Chapel in the house this morning? Okay, I'm just checking. Might have to go somewhere else, man. Right here. So it's important that you highlight that or that you recognize that. That others knew and others were watching. And that they, they recognized what was going on here. When the other servants, verse 31, when the other servants saw what happened, they were outraged. They went and they told their master everything that had happened. Just so you'll know, it's biblical to snitch. Hey, it's in the Bible. You ratted me out. It's, it's in the Bible, bruh. It's in the Bible. If your character ever gets in a corner, be careful. If there's ever a time for you to realize when you understand as a believer, as a follower of Christ, you want your family saved. Can you say amen? amen. We want our family saved. We want our friends saved. We want our coworkers to know about Christ. Then you've got to live a life recognizing that they're watching you. Amen. They're watching how you handle things. And listen, when everything's fine and wee, that means nothing. Amen. When you're in your wee moments, nothing. It's when all hell is breaking loose. It's when the storm is rain, raining so hard over you that even your friends or family that aren't saved are going, dang, and he's a Christian, is she saved? Man, I don't even know. If I, they're watching how you handle everything. Verse 32, the master, then the master called in the servant. He, he, he said, you wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy? Everybody say mercy. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. Would you, would you bow your heads with me? And Brother Robert, right here in front, Brother Robert, would you stand and would you pray over this message? Yes, we do. Everybody said amen, amen, amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord. There's an old story uh, about a guy sitting in a restaurant, minding his own business. Figures everything's going to be okay till some loudmouth bully walked in. And for some reason, the bully walked over. Bullies always look for, like a wolf looks for the weak. And he walks over to this small guy, small frame of a guy, little guy, you know, and he grabbed him and he forcefully threw him over his shoulder. And he told him, that's judo. I picked that up in Japan. Then the next thing he did, he, when he turned around to walk away, he smacked him right on the back of the neck, man. Just hit him square on the back of the neck. He said, that's karate. I picked that up in Korea. So the little guy just squirms away from him like, what the heck? People are watching. They're wondering what's going to go on. He went out to his truck. And when he came back in, he went right up to that bully, and he cracked him over the head. And he said, that's a crowbar. And I picked it up at Sears. That <laughs> just lets you know how old that story is because all the Sears are closing now. Huh? <laughs> it's one of my old stories there. Forgiveness is a very tough subject to speak on. Why? Because most people never come to a place where they actually completely forgive. Because forgiveness transforms a life completely. When you, when you have completely, completely 
dealt with, received, and, and placed yourself in that place of, of knowing and understanding forgiveness. Oh, it's an incredible liberty. But most people don't get past forgiving themselves. This is the, this is the biggest block that blockage that can be within a, a person's life who loves God and, and wants to serve God. And, 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 but, but let's say we know that we've made a wreck of things at times. And, and some of us can look back and say there's a lot of car, 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 cartilage. Car, yeah, there's a lot of break, broken things. There's a lot of broken glass. There you go. There's a lot of things in the past. And, and sometimes because we live in the here and now, some of those things will, once in a while will try and creep up into our lives. Well, what do you do when you run across somebody you haven't seen in a long time? What do you do when you run at somebody confronts you from some? I've had that happen to me. I've had that ha right face to face, and and I know exactly exactly what my my flesh wanted me to say. But the spirit man in me is supposed to rule the flesh, and the spirit man had to you know kind of whip through a bunch of hey you know what I was stupid, and I was wrong. And I should have done the right thing, but I didn't. And I'm sorry. And I can't, I can't say I'm sorry more than telling you I'm sorry. Forgiveness is, is a tough thing. And you can never move forward if you've never forgiven yourself. Many of us grew up in situations where we had no control over the family we grew up in. You, you might look back now and say, man, I wish you could have changed that family. No. That wouldn't have changed you. In order for God to know what, who you needed to be in Christ and what he wanted you to be in Christ, every avenue that you've gone down was for a purpose in your life. Even the ones that have painfully left you scarred. 9-11, 21 years ago, we hated, hated. Middle Eastern people. In America, it was tough to be Middle Eastern. In America, it was, I mean, it was tough. I remember watching things. I remember the news reporting things. I remember how bad it got. We, 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 are, we, are, we are a broken people. If something happens to you in your life, you often put that framework on somebody else. If, if somebody does you an injustice and their skin is a different color or they're from a different country or they have an accent, accent or something like that, you often put that in them. And you hold that against everybody. It was the same in Jesus' time. No difference. They did a uh, translation of words that was conducted. I don't know if it was an American company or a British company or somebody in Europe. And they did a poll on the translation of languages to discover the top 10 hardest words that you can translate from a native language into English or some a language understood. They used, and they used English. And they did this whole thing, and the votes were tallied up, and they were all brought in. And, and it said the, the number one above all the other ten, when they got the ten together, the, 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 the hardest word to translate is found, and I think I put that up for, for you. Brother Will will probably put it on the notes if you look on Facebook for the notes. But I think the, the word is from the Bantu language, which is in the Congo. It's a country inside of Africa, tough country. It has been through many, many, many wars and disturbances. But the word is called ilunga. Everybody see that? I L U N G A. Ilunga. Let me let me tell you. Let me translate for you what that word ilunga means. Ilunga means I will. Let me put it as a person. Ilunga means a person who will forgive any abuse the first time. Tolerate it the second time, but never the third. That's the word that they translate the best, one of the most difficult words for forgiveness. I'll forgive you once. I'll tolerate you twice. Eh, ain't no third time. No three times, my lady. It is not happening. That's an interesting word. Can somebody say amen? That's an interesting word. A, a person will forgive any abuse for the first time, tolerate the
the second time, but never the third time. Now go back to the scriptures. Go back to where we started, verse 21. Peter comes to Jesus, and he asks the Lord Jesus, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister? How many times do I forgive somebody when they've sinned against me? Should I, should I forgive them up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times, or seven times seven, as to what many people translate that, and some scriptures use it differently. That is a, that is a, 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 a very dramatic statement that, that the Lord is making. In that word, translation in the Conga, in that word, Ilunga, a person who forgives twice comes under that category. But a person with the ability to forgive an unlimited number of times is called a disciple of Jesus Christ, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because other than that, you can't do it. Without Christ in your life, you can't do it. I went through a number of things. Many, 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 some of you here weren't around in the 60s and maybe just barely, barely being born in the 70s or maybe not even that. But there's certain names that, that you can hear and, and immediately your mind just, that's like, oh, that's, that's evil. We, we, we remember the, remember the Zodiac Killer. We remember people like Charles Manson. We remember people like Richard Speck. We remember like Ted Bundy. We remember a lot of names, the Boston Strangler, Jeffrey Dahmer and, 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 uh, uh, uh uh, uh, just some others. I'm not even. I don't even know who they are. But there's another history has given us a lot of people. If, if you were going to battle some forgiveness, there's been a lot of people. Right. Well, how about this? How about the sinner? How about the thief that was on the cross? Three men were crucified. Christ and two thieves who deserved it. Right. Both men were mocking Christ. Until one got a revelation of some sort. And he stopped the mocking. And he began to speak to the Lord, can you remember me? When you come into this paradise, maybe he heard of Jesus, maybe he knew of Jesus. Can you remember me? And he, the Lord looks at him and he says to him, today, today, you're going to be with me in paradise. Today you're going to, can you, can you picture, I think it was Brother Robert sent a video out a long time ago. Well, can you imagine what it was like when that man walked into heaven? Because he died on that cross. Can you imagine what it was like when he got into heaven? He's at the gates of heaven. And they said, what are you doing here? Where? Here. Where's here? You don't know where here is? No. Nah. I don't know where here is. How'd you get here? I don't know. I was down there, then I'm here. What's here? This is heaven. How'd you get here? I don't know. You can't come in. I don't know. We can't let you in. I don't know. Well, what are you doing here? A man on the third cross, he said I could come. That's all he said. He didn't get baptized. They didn't take, take him down, throw some water on him. Somebody spit on him. <laughs> Baptize him. <laughs> he couldn't get a testimony together. He couldn't come down from the cross and live his life so that people would testify. He's a good Christian man. He believes in God. Oh, yes, follower of Jesus Christ. He didn't do any of that. He died. But he was given a promise. See, forgiveness is a powerful thing. It is the greatest thing that God has ever given to mankind. Yet, we don't understand it because most of us never get past first base when it comes to forgiveness. The 2020 News did a segment some time back. And they, uh, they talked about some of the vicious criminals that have done uh, terrible things uh, like, like some of the names that I gave you earlier and uh, Patty Hearst and all those uh, crazy things that went on and and I think it was on September 17th back in 90 
three. The New York Times put a, a story out, an interview, with, with the nephew of an officer that was killed at a bank robbery, a very famous bank robbery that took place many, many years ago when I was young. And the attitude of forgiveness or reconciliation was evident when the nephew of the officer, I believe the officer's name was Schroeder. His last name was Schroeder. I don't remember his first name. And um, he got up and he said these words. He said, you know, I was, a, I was very angry back then. If you would have asked me back then, I would have said, put her up against the wall and shoot her. This is the lady that was in, in the shooting that killed the officer there and robbing the bank. I would have loved to have taken her to my aunt's house and show her what she did to those nine children that belonged to my uncle. But as the interview went on, this man, his last name was Schroeder also, he said, but I find myself forgiving Miss Powers. I think it was like 40, 50 some years later. I don't remember exactly how long it was. He said, I was taught to forgive by my church. I was taught to forgive by my father. It gets embedded in you more and more as you get older. There's no, there's no good use in hating people. And yet we do. Oh, we catch ourselves irked at the way people act, at the way they, they behave. And sometimes with our own family, you know, you all, I can see you all. You all got, you all get, there's a family member. Oh, oh there she, oh, there she, there she is. Oh, I was hoping she'd get a front turn before she got here. Someplace at a wedding, at a funeral, there's always, oh, something, ah, God, something bad's going to happen. How do you know? Because they're here. There isn't, there's very, very, very few people that don't, that don't have that difficulty. That's an incredible story and a remarkable story of forgiveness. Where did we learn to forgive? In church. Where did he? In church and from his dad, from his family. What a great dad who teaches his son how to forgive. So let me give you a couple of points. I'm going to work through them quickly here. Number one, and you know this. Because you've heard this before, and I'm not sending out any new revelations here this morning. But forgiveness can be a tough, tough chore. Are you listening to me? Forgiveness is a very tough chore. What is a chore? It's an obligation. A chore is an obligation. When you have chores, you grew up with chores you have to do, you are obligated to do them. If you grew up and it was your chore to make sure the, the grass was cut and the trash was taken out, anytime there was trash piling up, in the, they knew you had an obligation to do what? Empty the trash, right? The grass is getting long. It looks like your dad's hair. Get out there and cut the grass, right? Are you following me, church? Forgiveness is a tough chore. It's, it's not an easy street. It's almost easier. To allow anger to stay in your life. It's almost more simple for us to hold on to things that we should forgive and we must forgive because Jesus said we should. Because you can't be forgiven if you hold unforgiveness against somebody else. Well, well, what if they did something horrible? I have friends. I have friends that when they got saved, I was a Bible study leader. When they got saved, they had family members that were killed, murdered. And about 10, 15 years ago, one of the family members went into the prison to talk to the man who had murdered his brother. Born again, he was, he was, in, my, he was in my Sunday school class when I was, when I was teaching the teenagers in the, in the Maywood building. And he went in to talk to him. And he talked to him. He, he wanted to represent his family, but his family had a rough time with it. But how can you not forgive? Oh, that's a terrible thing to lose a family member. It is. It's a horrible thing, especially in, in, a, in a murder situation, even if it's a wrong identity. But Jesus didn't give us any qualifications. Well, you can forgive if. And you don't have to forgive it if. He didn't say that. He said you must. Because when your sins are forgiven, you can't hold their sins 
against them. When you hold somebody's sins against them, you're, you are literally testifying. You don't believe your sins are forgiven. Because if somebody wiped your slate clean, you'd, got, you'd have no problem letting somebody else's slate be wiped clean. If God takes all of my past and washes it and makes it white as snow, I got nothing to say about what you've been through. I'm grateful. I'm thankful. But I want to give out that same forgiveness. It's not easy to forgive. People who don't have any connection or or people who have never had any association with someone who's been through a, a tragic situation like that. But I will tell you that I've learned through the years, in many years of being in the ministry and talking to families and talking to people, that there are some people that actually enjoy hating. There are some people that actually enjoy resentment. They like holding things. You know why? Because it's theirs and they own it. But they never live in liberty. They never live in peace. Every time a memory comes their way, boom, bang, there it is again. And many of us, many of us, that Christ comes and touches our life, he brings us in to the family of God. And we come in and he wants to work these things out, but we have a tough time letting him. Because sometimes we come from cultures that like holding on. I come from that kind of culture. I grew up with that kind of people around me. Not everybody, but there was some. And I know, I know it might have been a mom or a dad with some of you here, but there was some that would hold on a grudge like forever, ever, ever. Bruh. Ever. You know what I'm talking about here? I remember years back when Hillary Clinton was at a prayer breakfast in Washington, D.C., and the news planted up there because she had received, and she was joking, you know, everybody was kind of being having these little puns and some of the criticism that was going out. And she got up there to, to say something, and she said this. She said, you know, in the Bible, Jesus says that we must forgive seven times 70. And then she said, but I just want you all to know that I'm keeping a chart. It's like, you're keeping, hello, McFly, you're keeping a chart? You're keeping a chart. Let the chart go. There's too much on your notebooks. To worry about keeping a chart with everybody else. Can somebody say amen? Now, listen, I, I know, I know, I know she was joking. I get that. Of course, she was joking. She was being humorous. But she is stating something that is very obvious. You're hearing my voice, whether you're on Facebook or Instagram, or you're sitting in this building. And maybe you're watching us because you didn't make it this morning. But you're hearing my voice, and I'm telling you that if you're holding things in your life, it could be the very barrier, the very thing you're constantly, constantly battling with. Because it's in your heart. You, you know it's there, but you don't admit that it's there. Right. If that person, if that thing, if that situation rose up in front of you, it would just, you would react in the same way. Turn around, run, hide, irk, irk, your face would curt. Yeah. Have a seizure. Let me read you from a discipleship magazine. Let me read you from a discipleship. Everybody's going, man, Pastor Phil's going to lose it right now. If I lose it, run. <laughs> Yankovic was a, uh, was a uh, partnership, Yankovic Incorporated, many years back. And uh, they, they did a, a poll. It was, you know how they have all these polling uh, businesses that go around taking the, uh, asking people questions and stuff? And, and they did a poll to measure... Uh, People's forgiveness, how, how much people could forgive people that had wronged them, okay? And uh, most people said that they would be able to forgive someone who, who, who told a lie of, about them. But 67% but of the people that they asked the question said they could forgive someone who stole from them. On the other hand, 32% would not forgive someone who slapped them or punched them in the face. That's interesting, isn't it? Huh? 15% of people believed they could forgive a person who had murdered their child. 15%. 15%. Think about what that says to who we trust. If I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then he knows exactly what it is I'm going to experience in my lifetime. God knows exactly what 
what painful situation I'm going to go through. He is going to be there for everything I need, for everything that comes into my life. He's never going to leave me. He's never going to forsake me. You've read those words. You've read those words in your Bibles, not just listening to this preacher here. You've read them yourself. You've taken them personal. Whatever it is that I need, he'll be there. Wherever I'm at, he'll make a way there. Depths of the ocean, mountains in a cave, wherever it is, in a dungeon, in a prison, nothing can stop him from being there. But if there's something in your life that you would say in your mind, I don't think I can forgive that. Whoa. Each of us need to look deep, deep in our hearts to see if we might be among those percentages. It's not easy to forgive. Say it to your neighbor again. It's not easy to forgive. Listen, forgiveness is so rare that sometimes you can't, you can't even recognize when it happens. When the riots hit, y'all y'all remember the Rodney King? Can't we all just get along? Shh, we're America. Everybody thinks we just get along. <laughs> America's got problems too. America's got issues too. Can you say amen? amen. Yeah. Years back, you watched on TV Reginald Denny. Remember that truck driver? Got beaten with bricks, hit with a hammer. Remember all that? It's coming back to you a little bit. Right, right, just believe me, the action was two blocks away from where Sister Didi and I and our kids uh, have grown up. When the riots had settled following all the emotion and all the emotional charge that was around, they pulled Denny from the truck, did all that stuff that came out on national TV. He was nearly killed. Later, he met his attackers. He shook their hands. You know what he did? He forgave them. Oh, that's deep. Because after watching it, oh, heck no. Oh, that was me. I pulled out my phone. Getting a hit on all that. He forgave them. He almost died. Took his life. He probably was a little slower because of the beats that his head took. Do you know what one one of those? Uh, and I really don't have good words for the news media because they're just there's a word for them that I can't use behind the pulpit. They don't they don't care what happens to anybody. All they care is that they get the scam the the scene. They want to be first. They want to film it first. They want to know about it first. They want to shout it first. They don't care if it hurts anybody or anything. But here's what one reporter said. It said that Mr. Uh, Denning is suffering from brain damage. That's why he forgave them. Brain damage, huh? That's how some people react to the idea of forgiveness. You see, forgiveness is greater than you. It's greater than you. It's greater than me. If you can't forgive, you can't be a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because you are, you will be, you are even now, if you have it, you are greatly hindered by, by what can be a wild animal that lives inside of you, waiting, waiting to set his, their eyes on something that will remind you of, a, of an injustice of something that was horrible, that was awful, that shouldn't have happened, but it did because we live in a world that's broken. i got to hurry up. I'm talking too much. Number two. Everybody say number two. Okay, number two. Forgiveness is an essential to living an abundant life. If you want to live the life that Jesus spoke, that we have been given, promised by him to live, Forgiveness is an essential. It is a must. Look at your neighbor and say, it's a must, okay? That's why Jesus emphasized it. This is why Jesus 
emphasized it to those that were followers, to those disciples, even to the crowd. Do, do you remember in the scripture in the book of John? I don't know exactly where, probably like uh, the sixth, one of the long chapters when Jesus started talking heavy with him about his, his body, taking his body and the blood and the, and the bread and the representation. And when he started talking heavy, the Bible tells us in the scripture, in the book of John, that there were many of the followers that started to back off. There were some that didn't follow him anymore. They, they started drifting away. The disciples, thank God they stayed. Can you say amen? Thank God they stayed. All Jesus worried about was that, sure, he loved everybody. He healed many people. But he focused on the twelve. Forgiveness. I want to live an abundant life. How, life. How about you? Forgiveness and true happiness go hand in hand. Forgiveness and joy goes hand in hand. You will not experience the joy of the Lord if you do not allow forgiveness in your life. And if you allow it in your life, you're going to have to give it out too. If you allow it in your heart, into your life, you're going to have to give it out to others. You're going to have to give it to those that might have been affected by that very thing in the past. There was an article in USA. They, you know, they're always talking about people's psyche thing, especially now. It's a real popular thing. Everybody's got issues. It's like they want every church to have a psychologist and a psychoanalysis. And, but our church, we just have cycles. So we don't have <laughs> They want all that. They want professional. They say, <laughs> I'm sorry, your pastor is. They say every church needs this because of how much, how much, Mental stuff we go through. And listen, I, I acknowledge that. We do. Especially if you come from a broken past. Can you say amen? Yeah. Especially if you come from a, a family that had been busted up for years and you were born into that busted up broken glass thing. But, but the reality is that they do all these psychologists and analyzing things and they've come up, once in a while they come up with something that you go, ah, now they're thinking like human beings here. And they, they made this statement, I think it was the University of Michigan, that they have discovered, what they discovered was that forgiveness is the single behavior that is most strongly linked to happiness inside somebody's life. Do you know why? Because happiness is an attitude. You choose to be happy. Oh, no, I got no control. Liar. Liar, no lie. In church, no lie. You choose. You choose whether you want to be happy. You choose whether you want to be all cara de chancla, you know? What's wrong? Nothing. You make a choice. You can choose to be happy. It doesn't matter. Okay, it's storming on the inside. I get it. It storms in a lot of people's lives. I go through trials. Anybody go through trials? I have some really humdingers, man. I have some really bad uh, trials. The devil hates me. Believe me. He hates me. In the years that Sister Dee Dee and I have been serving God since, since, I, since we were t almost teenagers, I can guarantee you he hates me. Right. A lot. And every now and then he reminds me how much he hates me. But I choose to be happy. A lot of my grandkids who don't know my dad are learning about my dad from their parents. And once in a while, my grandkids would say, ooh, my mom says you're acting just like grandpa. <laughs> ooh. And I'm telling you, that hits hard. My, I loved my dad and everybody who met my dad. My dad just, just was too, too straightforward. To, Man, you all right, dad? Smile. I am. We bought him an eagle. You know the picture of the eagle? It's like that real serious look like he's going to eat you like a trout. And then on the bottom, yeah, like a bot on the bottom it says, I am smiling. That was my dad. I, I force myself when I when it clicks in my head. Don't don't man be like Grandpa Manuel. Cause it's in me. Cause his DNA is in me. So happiness is something you have to focus on. That 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 be it's a behavior thing. Okay, forgiveness 
is, is, the, is the behavior that is most strongly linked to a life that's filled with joy, to a life that has abundance, to a life that lives in, in success, in happiness, in, in a wellness in, in their mentality. You can, you, can, you can never be truly happy unless the, there's, there's a part of your life that, that, that has forgiveness in it, if it harbors resentment, if it harbors things that you hold against people or somebody else or some situation, you will never walk. In the joy of the Lord. There was a teacher that did an experiment to her kids. And she had all the kids bring in plastic bags. All the kids brought in plastic bags. And she brought in a whole bunch of potatoes. And she had all the kids put, I don't know how many of them, like, like 15 or 20 potatoes. I don't know if they were like the big spuds or the small ones. But she filled up those bags with potatoes. And she gave them to each of the kids in her class. Probably back in those days it was maybe 25, 20, 25 kids. <laughs> Nowadays, they max those classes out. And so the, the, the lesson was they had to carry the spuds around all day in school and bring them back the next day. And she had to tell them, don't let your moms cook them. <laughs> Got to bring them back. And when they brought back the next day, so, some of the kids, you know, uh, said that, the potatoes were already going bad, or, or I think it was a week or so, or a couple of days, and she, you know, she started. She goes, "Oh, that one, oh, they smell. Yeah, that's terrible. That's it. Just keep carrying it. You take yours home too." And, take, and she finally gave them the lesson. She says, "You know, when you harbor something in your heart, when you hold on to something like unforgiveness in your heart, the longer you hold it, the worse it gets. The longer you keep it, the smellier it gets." I hate using that to you, but it's true. Because there's, there's, a, there's a scent on somebody when, when their life has no, no joy, no happiness. no, no you don't, you don't re Do you understand that when you give your life to Christ, he, he washes the slate. He forgives you. This is the battle we have with forgiving one another. How much did it take for you not to forgive? Well, I got it written somewhere. I just can't say it right now. Next time you file away a, a wrong that someone did to you or someone had done to you, think of those slimy potatoes in a bag. As a matter of fact, do your own experiment and carry one around for about a week and see how that holds you. Because it's true. The longer you harbor a negative thing in your life, a negative feeling towards someone else, you're cheating yourself out of the abundant life that Jesus promised us to have. Are you listening to me? The best thing you and I can do, the best thing that you can do for your heart, not just muscle that's beating, but your thoughts and your conscience, the best thing you could do is to forgive. Clean the slate. Let, let, the, let, the thing, let it go. Tell somebody, let it go. Think, think, think about Think about the members in your family that will carry that thing because you carried it for so many years. Think about your children that will carry those situations because they've got your DNA. Oof. I can't go no further. i got to stop. Last thing, last thing, last thing. Forgive, forgiveness. This is, this is the most important here, okay? Or even more important, I should say. Forgiving is, is a life that is being lived in the image of Christ Jesus. Forgiving is you and I living our life in the image of of Christ our Savior. When you forgive, you're testifying like a huge billboard. Christ lives in me. Christ lives in me, and because he lives in me, I will not. I choose not to hold anything against somebody. Well, the guy hit my car and took off running. Well, the cops caught him. I didn't. I ain't holding nothing against him. If he got in trouble, I hope he can get himself out. I let my insurance handle that. But I ain't holding anything against that man. Because I've ran away from some things. And, oh, I, you don't want me to go there, huh? Because you know I'm just talking about me. I'm not talking about y'all. 
Even as a Christian, there are some people that do some really slinky con artists. Woo! You find out the government's getting money, I'm going to give me some. Right or wrong, if they give it to me, got to be right, right? Jesus let me have it. He'll, 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 let, he'll, he'll, he'll let you have 20 years in jail, too, if you do a robbery. That's the principle. That's the reason why we forgive. The reason why we forgive is we want, we want to live in the image of Christ. We want to live in the image of Christ in front of a world, in the front of a world that is dying and going to hell. Maybe we don't think that way anymore. But those people that you work with on your job, family members that haven't given their life to the Lord Jesus Christ, if they die in their sins, they die without Christ. Well, God's made a promise to me. Yes, he has. And if they'll yield when the Holy Spirit is knocking on their door, we'll shout hallelujah. But they've got to hear your words. They've got to be, they've got to be pulled by your words, by your love. Lastly, let me do this and I'm going to close. Martin Niemöller, I'm not even saying the word. He's a Lutheran pastor. He was a Nazi prisoner in, uh, in the war. He learned the meaning of forgiveness. From his prison experience. When he was in this cell. He could see through a small little window. Not even a window. Probably a broken piece of wood. He could see people that were being put to death. Every single day. Day by day. There were people being gassed and killed. He began to ask himself. What he would say. And what he would do when his time came around. Would he curse them? Would he lash out? He realized if Jesus had done this, then we wouldn't have the gospel. If Jesus would have hung on the cross and said, Father, smoke them. And lightning would have came down, just cooked them all, made chicharrones out of all of them. We wouldn't have this gospel. Did you hear me, church? He said, it took me a long time to learn that God is not the enemy of my enemies. I'm going to say it again, folks. I want you to hear this because I'm closing right now. He said, it took me a long time to learn that God is not the enemy of my enemies. He's not even the enemy of his enemy. Because Jesus on that cross, these are his words, cried out these words, Father, forgive them because they know not what they do. Close your Bibles up this morning. You and I want to live as Jesus lived. We want to live for Christ. We want to live a life that is Christ-like around a world that doesn't know the hope that we have. And we don't want to carry that hope around and hide it from them. We want to show it off. We want the world to know they don't have to live in that bondage. That the devil's a liar. Yes, he, he lies, he cheats, he steals, and he's a con artist. And he plays us like puppets. Stand to our feet. You know, many years ago, some of you don't remember, there used to be a funeral uh, mortuary on the corner of Tyler and the freeway. Remember that funeral? And many years ago, before we left to Puerto Rico, I think it was, wasn't it, when I did that crazy thing? I went and borrowed one of the dollies that they put the casket on. I know, I, I was crazy back then. I'm kind of crazy now, but not, not that crazy. But I was crazy back then. I was young, did anything. I'd start a fight to get people around and tell the gospel. Went to Puerto Rico, had these two teenagers that were my disciples, you know, Huey and Dewey, and oh, we miss Louie, he wasn't there. But. And I remember I would take them to the beach, and we'd go someplace, and we'd put a bullhorn inside an ice chest. And I'd sit on an ice chest, and they'd start fighting, and people would start coming. And they'd start yelling, and people, when the crowd got there, they'd stop. i open up the ice chest, we'd start preaching, tell them, Jesus loved you. Tell them about you, and he'd repent of their sins. So I went to the mortuary, and, and I asked them if I could borrow an old dolly that they had. I said, it doesn't have to be a good one, an old one. I'm going to do a, an outreach, and I'll bring it back to you. And they lent it to me. I built a coffin. Oh, no, actually, you know what? They gave me a cheap little coffin they had there. And I took that coffin, reinforced it. I put a car battery in it. I put one of my old stereos in it, 8-track. No, it might have been not 8 I don't remember. It was old stereo. And I put speakers. 
And we did a drama. Took a guy, dressed him up like the devil. And it wasn't, wasn't hard to do. He, he, anyway, took a, dressed him up like the devil, put strings in his hand. And everybody was tied to a puppet, tying, and walked him down. One of the boulevards. Did it in Huntington Park. Walked him down Pacific Avenue with everybody seeing. Everybody was dressed up, man, eyes all messed up, tacks on their neck, and on there's hickeys, and all, not real ones, but, you know, all that kind of stuff. And when people seen it, it's like, oh, my God, that's horrible. That's disgusting. It's like, wait, don't, don't get upset. This is how the devil lies to us. Because we look God on the inside, but he's got his, he's got his ropes onto us with our addictions. Right. And he holds on to us. Well, listen to me, church. One of them strings can be forgiveness in your life. And he, he never wants you to have the freedom that God has for you. Bow your heads with me this morning. He, he doesn't want you to get the freedom that God has for you. I don't want to be a slave to the devil. I don't want anybody to be enslaved to old unforgiveness that we've not let go. I don't know if you've been through an injustice. Maybe you have. But you need to put it in his hands. Let him take it away. Because it's a bondage in your life. And it may be the very thing that keeps you from moving forward. It's the thing that's keeping you from being able to live a life in the joy of the Lord. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it abundantly you'll never experience you'll never experience and I'm not going to have anybody live, lift their hands or anything I'm going to open the altar up and I'm just going to ask you to come and talk to the Lord if you want to kneel you can kneel if you want to stand you can stand but if you've got stuff in your life you haven't let go I want to invite you right now to come and let God help you if you're here this morning and you don't know Christ as your Savior and you don't never asked the Lord to forgive you of her sins. You've never said, Jesus, come, come and be my Lord and Savior. I know you can, I know we can grow up in religion and we can know how to go to church and we can do all our sacraments as many of us did when we were young, but we never really made him Lord of our life. If there's, if there's something I would tell you this morning, you need to make Jesus Lord of your life. You need to give him access, access to your heart, access to your spirit, access to that inner man, that inner woman that's in your life. Gracious King, come, don't wait. You're, you're, don't let that burden stay inside you, holding on to that burden. Come and leave it at this altar. Leave it right here. Don't take it home with you. Leave it right here and let God bring freedom. Let God bring freedom and liberty into your life. Hallelujah. Oh, gracious God. By your presence, Lord.
Come on, church. We've all gone through hurts in our lives, right? We've all experienced, and we're going to continue to experience hurts. People are going to hurt us. I, I really pray that God would give us the strength to forgive people. Come on, lift up your hands. And holy spirit. 
Spirit, you are welcome. Dear. Come on, church, sing it. This place and fill the atmosphere. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. Lift up your hands, come on. Be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your glory, God, is what our hearts long for. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Your presence, Lord. Oh, my God. You and I want to live as Jesus lives. Forgiveness is what Jesus is all about. Somebody asked you, man, oh, tell me about this Jesus. It's about forgiveness. There's no other religion in the world that has a price paid for the forgiveness of sins. Are you listening to me? Even those who hated him, even those who cursed him, those who had their sins nailed to that Golgotha tree never to be forgotten even those who spit at him beat him drove nails in his hands and his feet have their sins removed by his grace and all you gotta do is ask are we a privileged people or what man I'm <laughs> When, when we forgive others, when we forgive others, all we're doing is repeating what was done on our behalf over 2,000 years ago on Calvary, on that mount called Golgotha, the Skull Hill, where all the poor people were buried and burned because they couldn't afford to be buried. This is our witness. Can you say amen? This is our witness to the world that we have been redeemed. We forgive as we've been forgiven. And when that happens, God blesses our lives and we become a blessing to others and others and to ourselves. Hallelujah. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Let's bow our heads. Would you, Pastor Johnny, would you close us in a word? Hallelujah. God bless you. Don't forget those.